my love for Laura Nero is very deep, very long, like the Ganges River, or tall like a Himalayan mountain. I went away when I was 15, 15 years old on an acting scholarship from Plano, Michigan, High School, Michigan, Plano, Plano High School, to Michigan State University in, in Ann Arbor. For two weeks, they paid for me to go there to study acting and to study how they did set design and lighting. And during my stay there, it was really revolutionary in my mind to be gone away from home and to be on the campus and have time at night to dance by myself if I wanted to, to the doors, just for long periods, just dancing by myself to the doors. Or walking down the streets close by the campus where I could hear music floating out from the record shops. And one day I'm walking and I'm hearing the music floating out, Stone Soul Picnic by Laura Nero. I didn't know who it was, but it was captivating, all the harmonies. So I walk in the record shop, I say, what are you playing? They say, oh, it's Laura Nero, Stone Soul Picnic. And they show me the album cover, it's this beautiful lady. Beautiful. And you pull out the sleeve and it smells like flowers. Then they say to me, and all the harmonies are her. And it's full of harmonies, like 30, 40 voices going on. In 67, that was unheard of. But it was true. Then on come the next songs on the, on the album. And it could be either really deep and tender, like just completely vulnerable, or smashing and screaming with a bunch of voices coming at you. And I just fell in love with it. I had enough to buy the album. I brought it home to my campus and just lived with it. And it became part of my soul. It was one of the few albums that could touch the pain of my spirit, touch the pain of my soul, and sing about things I needed to hear about. So she was deep to me. And she was Jewish. She had black in her, though. You could hear that she, all the inflections. She had the soul in her enough that would tantalize my ear because I love the Delphonics, you know, with Stylistics and Motown and Curtis Mayfield. She had enough of that in her, as well as she could be folky, too. Like, and when I die, or she could be like, you know, Eli's coming, better hide your heart. She had it all going on. Or a, the beauty of Emily. Emily, you're the natural snow. You're the natural snow, the unstudied sea. You're a cameo. So she's very beautiful in her writing. Very, very beautiful. And the chord changes were like unheard of. What she would mix and match together from soul music to this new Laura Nero music. So she just really touched me, man. Then I went to my senior year. I left home when I was 16. And out came her next album, which, which would be her third album called New York Tenderberry. And I had to drive long distances to see my love at the time in the middle of the night. On 8-track, I'd have the New York Tenderberry album, a song called You Don't Love Me When I Cry. This is very, very deep. Uh, and Mercy on Broadway. And uh, the theme New York Tenderberry is very, very heavy and very depressing. But it could get the, the scar and the wound off me. That's how deep she was. More than anybody else is Laura New York to me. Then I went to college, and then there came out the fourth album called Christmas and the Beads of Sweat with Arif Mardin and Felix Cavalier from the, from the Rascals album producer. At that time, I was a real, real fan. Then I went back and bought the first album called The First Songs and then fell in love with the early, early things that she had done. They weren't produced as beautifully, but the songs are beautiful, like Lazy, Lazy Susan and a song I love to this day, which is um, I Never Meant to Hurt You. It's so beautiful. So Laura Nero to me, piano, vocally, is able to go to a place that's all her own. That's all her own. And her own Jewish, black, white mixture, whatever it is. She got soul. So then she puts out an album with actually Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells backing her up called It's Gonna Take a Miracle. And then they cover I Hear the Bells, written by Marvin Gaye, or I'll Never Hear the Bells. If You Leave Me, I'll Never Hear the Bells. It was first put out by, by a group called The Originals that Marvin produced and wrote. But when she got a hold of it and had Pat LaBelle backing her, backing her up, Pat LaBelle and the Bluebells backing her up, 
Then that became a whole new thing. And then Patty going off was incredible. And then they recorded a subway song called Oh My Desiree with all the echo in the street subway that she was raised like a little girl in New York City hearing. And Laura's dad was a trumpet player, a jazz guy. And the last name is, is Nero, but it actually could be Negro. So it's all in her, the music, man. And then, for example, I heard stories like when she was making New York Tenderberry, she would ride a carriage from her home through Central Park, a horse-drawn carriage every day to the studio in her black shawl, and then get there and then record. And it's very, very deep. I just love her with all my heart. Then guess what? Because I love her so much, she's playing in the wine country. I get to meet her. And I tell her how much I love her. And I beg her to come back to our studio, Tarpan Studios, and she does. The following day or next day, whenever it is, she comes here. Oh my God. And I'm a complete wreck, because it's Laura Nero who's here. And we're gonna cut together, so I get my best musicians in. Frank's here, uh, Kunga's and bass and whatever, and she's on the piano over there. I'm on my drums, and we cut a song called The Heebie Jeebies, which is a slow R&B jam. And we cut it about 13 different times to get the, the version she loves. And after we cut it, then I have time to hang out with her. And we go in my office. She says, well, ask me questions. I said, well, what's it like for you to write all the songs you've written? She says, well, it's like going into a sandbox. And you gotta feel like you're in a sandbox and you can trust your sandbox to do whatever you wanna do and say whatever you wanna say and not edit yourself. Just be who you are and let it all come out. So, okay. And I said, I know that's true because I'm hearing you do that in your, in your writing. You're not editing anything. Yeah. So you gotta have a lot of trust, a lot of confidence to be able to do that. But I've learned to let myself just do that and be who I am. So she just, you know, like, put a stamp on everything I know was right anyway. Believe in who you are. If it's snot coming out of your nose, let the snot coming out of your nose. If there's tears coming out of your eyes, let the tears coming out of your eyes. And if you can, and if you can describe what the burn feels like when you're heartbroken, if you can describe what it feels like to have to be made love to by someone who don't really love you and leave you, describe it. That's what Laura Nero can do. And quite frankly, all the great poets have that ability. Truly, that's why we love them because they can touch us in a place. For a lot of people, it's rarefied air. They can't go there. They aren't vulnerable enough. They aren't innocent enough. They aren't pure enough to go there. So I will say this right now. As a little kid, I experienced that deep emotion with Nina Simone. She went there. Crossing over to Joni Mitchell. Love her, too, in a different way. First, I love Joni as a folk singer from Canada. You know what I mean? Mor Morning Morgantown, the album. Morning Morgantown and... And Joni, the very first thing she did with David Crosby, very heavy and light with an acoustic guitar. I had a two week break. I graduated in high school in 1970 and came, drove my friend out to visit her, her father, who was a film director in Malibu, living way up in the mountains, overlooking the sea with a bunch of peacocks, walking around like a nudist type thing, no, no clothes on, and had a beautiful lady who was living with her. She had no clothes on. But the music they were playing was Ladies of the Canyon by Joni Mitchell. I was like, damn. So here I'm walking around here in Ladies of the Canyon by Joni Mitchell. And that became the soundtrack of my of my what I first experienced hanging in California. And when I went back home, she stayed on my mind. Then out come the album called Blue. With, you know, all I want and Carrie and all the things that are on, on the Blue album. And how deep that record is, like the river. And I wish I had a river I could skate away on. And she became deep like, over time, kind of like what Laura could get into. Not editing herself too much, just telling her stories. Joni came from the folk more into jazz as she was growing. Whereas Laura came from more from folky vibe, whatever, more into her soul, the soul side. Speaking on Joni, though, you look at the guy, what she got with that great drummer, uh, she dated John Gurwin when she made the Court and Spark album. See, you can feel him in that loving her, holding her, caressing her, the way he played with her on those drums and knew when to lay back and let those songs breathe. That's her classic album, the Court and Spark album. That's when the whole universe bowed down to Joni Mitchell.
You know what I mean? Uh, with a song called Help Me. Help Me, I'm Falling in Love Again. Because it was commercial, she found how to do it her own way. Because it took John Gurren with that groove to make it commercial. And people in Michigan, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Michael Travis, loved Help Me, of Court and Spark. So, and then recently in my life, uh, I've met Joni Mitchell a few times and I saw her struggle. Here I'm watching my hero, Joni Mitchell, having such a hard time to get in, the, get in her car. And she has these beautiful nurses with her who love her, but she has to kind of maneuver herself, her body, after she had a brain issue, how to maneuver her body to get, to get in the car. And I just pray for her and love her, you know. But she's there. She's at all the things that are going on in L.A. If Clive's having something, she'll show up. If Shaka Khan's going to be awarded, she'll show up. She's around the music, and I think she's still back riding and doing something right now. So I have major love for, for doing Joni Mitchell. Major love for her. And one of the guys I helped bring on the scene was Jaco Pastores. He injected her with a lot of love and musicality. So...